We're at a uh, gallery run by Max Well Ram. The name of the gallery is Essex Street, like the street. Here I am. Uh, it's uh, sometime in February. I'm with the legendary, uh, notorious, uh, Tristram Shandy-esque, uh, non-revolutionary, pro-evolutionary uh, Peter Fenn. And Peter has uh, made, orchestrated, uh, conceived, envisioned, imagined, and hallucinated, and engineered a art exhibition, which in effect is uh, a, a kind of mini retrospective. But unlike most retrospectives, which are greatest hits, this is a kind of retrospective of blind spots. It's a survey of every thing that wasn't realized to its capacity. The show, which has the subtitle, may not be seen or read or done, is a work that has not happened to be shown. And I can say that in every case, something here has not been shown. In one case, the not showing actually was by me. For me, it doesn't seem so simple that these things were censored or blocked or denied or funding was withdrawn. I think one of the values of the show is how much it gets at the structural problems of art making, of institutions. The institution, you know, be that a government or a museum or an art dealer, is fundamentally an editor. And with that editorial capacity, built into that is also a, a kind of castration ability, a castration responsibility that I say, it stops here, the painting stops here, um, I even put a date on it, 2012. And in that like very structural you know, uh, uh, castration is a problem for you, that it's not allowed to go on, it's not allowed to go further. What advice do you have for support structures to somehow be editors? But well, I guess I, the, the advice I would give is to uh, is Elise Fair. Um, first, uh, I will say that in every case, funding was not cut. In fact, funding was actually increased. Okay. More money was spent by Tokyo Metropolitan Government to build a fake version of this thing than it would have cost to build the real thing. Uh, and in the case over here in Germany, they doubled my fee to then encourage me to give over all the intellectual property of my project and say, okay, we'll have the experts do it for you. The problem here, and I, th I appreciate your question, let the artist be the fool. Let the artist make the mistake. Let the artist do the thing. Do not require that the thing meet standards of normal PEP scientific practice. Uh, you're not here to show finished product, you're here to show the artist in action. And the artist can then claim a piece of that action. In fact, in the case of Germany, I said, I just want 25% of the project as it emerges. I understand that I'm not the expert in everything, but I want to have the chance to do the first step. And they somehow felt that <laughs> we can't do this because what if it doesn't really quite work? Well, let it really quite not work. Let the artist be the avant-garde. So the institutional requirement I'm going to ask is that the artist when they make a funded proposal, and then it is within the range, and actually I did do the thing, and I did show it can be done, and I, I proved it's feasible. Let the hunky-dory, rinky-dinky, not so good, not quite professional thing happen, because without that historical event of the action, there's no then cue for proceeding with a more rigorous scientific fulfilling of the action on an industrial scale. And I think the, the tragedy of the show is that in every case where the work gets blocked, what happens is that the historical possibility is not realized. If we had just done the lousy real rig and the real water in our not so good way in 1996 and 1999, then this technology would be well established by now. The artist is the avant-garde. Their function is to pioneer. That was very clear in the case of my water wheel thing for the, this river in, the, in, uh, in Bavaria. I don't know if it works. Let's at least show it. We can try it out. People are ready to go for $10,000 on it. Let the artist be the fool. There are 12 projects on display here, each one in document form. 
made up of a combination of emails, letters, invitations, archival photos from long ago, uh, and then it's all kind of covered over in a kind of diaristic narrative that Peter has written, which explains the kind of the arc of each one of these projects. So each one begins with a kind of idea for an artwork, some of which were put in exhibitions, some were invited by exhibitions such as Documenta, Venice Biennale, and then as you move through the artwork, you begin to see roadblocks, you begin to see excuses from curators. With all of these, you have claims and hypotheses and sometimes reasonable expectations that had these works been shown to their fullest, the world would be a different place. And, and many people have written about you, had these things been done, there wouldn't be this economic or this environmental crisis. But something about that reminds me of art in general. You don't see its immediate effects. Therein lies its power. You can't measure or gauge whether it's successful or not. Because these haven't been realized, they still have a success potential. Whereas if they had been realized, we would know. My concern really is uh, that we, we, as a civilization, are running out of time. We really have a very serious global problem. And uh, uh, of the survival of the human race is at issue. So we don't really have time. Now, to give, let's say, take a look at this piece over here. Um, here's a case where I think we have a, a, a serious ma uh, matter of profound delay. Um, in New Zealand, it is reported as of 2010 that they are somehow the world pioneers in the idea of water plants uh, from rivers like Elodia and Ceratophila when certain water plants, ligneous plants, who made it to methane gas. And they say it's from a work at, with American Firm Ocean Earth, my company, okay. But anyway, that's where we are, 2010. But in this year, 2000, the year 2000, 10 years earlier, I was given an offer based on work I had shown in Chicago by an institute uh, for $2 million to work for two years to work on just that idea. And I have since developed some ideas of rates and things in the water. But I mean, the point is that obviously if I had spent two years with $2 million budget and so on, I would have figured out all kinds of solutions to that issue. And this would have happened 10 years before what is now being promoted in the New Zealand press is 2010. Now that's quite important because the Midwest of the United States, this whole area within this passion of the Gulf of Mexico, has enormous amounts of excess plants stuck behind dams and various lakes, and they don't know what to do with them, and this is exacerbated by the runoff from the uh, farming. So you have a lot of very just serious problems with the eutrophication of the water. This could have been addressed, this could be a technology, this could be a know-how. And the 10-year delay is quite serious because we have not yet developed a really good biogas industry, and we could. Um, now, another point, just to bear in mind, the reason why this didn't happen is that a man came up from Houston, uh, you can check him on the web, his name is Richard Hout. I've checked him on the web. And you can see what he does, and he's really into the environmentally safe drilling, and his companies were Stat Oil and Exxon and Halliburton, and they are working on this rig, which is now in question, there's a legal question about whether that rig can even be there. Uh, it's in the court right now in um, uh, somewhere in Louisiana, I think St. Charles of Louisiana, and I'm saying, hey, let's start now with other forms of biogas energy production there, and let's start also to say it, we cannot just have the oil companies do things their way. We have to do other things in this whole region in the way that was manifested or identified in this uh, $2 million grant way back then. That's the delay we need to overcome. We can't say, okay, it was sort of slowed down because we have no time.